Until yesterday, Felix had never given a second thought to the number of rats in the sewers. Now he saw that they were everywhere. They scuttled away from the lights as the watchman approached and he could hear the pitter-patter of their feet behind them after they had gone. Their eyes caught the reflection of the lantern and glittered like tiny stars far off in the darkness of the Undercity. He found himself wondering now if there was any connection between the rats and the Skaven. He started to imagine the little ones as spies for their larger brethren. It was a madman's fantasy, he knew, one straight out of the tales of sorcery he had read as a boy. But the more he thought about it, the more terrifying the prospect became. Rats were everywhere in the great cities of man, living amid the garbage and refuse of civilization. They could see much and overhear much and go, if not unnoticed, at least unsuspected. He began to feel their cold eyes staring malevolently at him even as he walked. The walls of the sewer seemed to close in about him threateningly and he imagined himself caught in a vast warren. Thinking of the Skaven out there, it suddenly seemed possible to him that he was in a vast burrow, that he and the others had been shrunk to the size of mice and that the Skaven were ordinary rats walking upright and dressed in a fashion that aped man. The fantasy became so vivid and compelling that he began to wonder whether the fumes of the stew were going to his head, or whether the scent-deadening narcotics prescribed by the city alchemists had hallucinatory side effects. Steady, manling, he heard Gotrick say. You're looking very pale there. I was just thinking about the rats. In the tunnels your own mind creates its own foes. It's the first thing a tunnel fighter learns to guard against. You've done this sort of thing before then, Felix said, half sarcastically. Yes, Manling, I was fighting in the depths before even your father was born. The ways around the Everpeak are never free of foes and all the citizens of the King's Council do their share of military service in the depths. More young dwarfs die that way than any other. Gotrick was being unusually forthright, as he sometimes was before moments of great peril. Danger made him garrulous, as if he wanted to communicate with others only when he realised he might never get another chance. Or perhaps he was simply still drunk from the night before. Felix realised he would never know. Fathoming the dwarf's alien mind was nearly as far beyond him as was understanding a skaven. I can remember my first time in the tunnels. Everything seemed cramped. Every sound was the tread of some secret enemy. If you listen with fearful ears, you are soon surrounded by foes. When the true foe comes, you have no idea from which quarter. Stay calm, Manling. You'll live longer. Easy for you to say, Felix muttered, as the hefty slayer shoved past. All the same, he was reassured by Gotrek's presence. With some trepidation, they approached the place where Gant had been killed. Mist rose from the surface of the stew, and in places a slow current was evident in the sludge. The area of the fight looked very much the same as Felix remembered, except the body was gone. The area where the corpse had lain was disturbed. There was a trail in the slime that suddenly ended at the ledge side, as if the body had been dragged a short way, then dumped. He knew they should have shifted it yesterday when they had the chance, but they had been too shaken, 
disturbed and excited by what had happened to do so. No one had wanted to carry the mangy, rat man body, and now it wasn't there. Someone took it, Hef said. I wonder who, Spider said. Gotrick scanned the ledge where the body had been. He bent down and peered closely at the tracks, then rubbed his eye patch with his right fist. The hatchet which had killed the Skaven came dangerously close to his tattooed scalp. Wasn't a man, anyway, that's for sure. All sorts of scavengers in the sewers, Rudy said. He voiced the common belief of all sewer jacks. There are things you wouldn't believe living in the stew. I don't think it was any scavenging animal, Gotrek said. Skaven, Felix said, voicing their unspoken thoughts. Too big, one of them was anyway. The other tracks might be Skaven. Felix peered out into the gloom. It suddenly appeared even more menacing. How big? He cursed himself for taking on the same monosyllabic way of speaking as the others. How large exactly was the creature you referred to, Gotrek? Perhaps taller than you, Manling. Perhaps heavier than Rudy. Could it be one of the mutants you say the Skaven breed? A hybrid of some sort? Yes. But how can all those prints simply vanish? Felix asked. They can't all have thrown themselves in the stew, can they? Sorcery, Hef said. Of the blackest sort, Spider added. Gotrick looked down at the ledge and cursed in his native tongue. He was angry and his beard bristled. The light of mad violence shone in his one good eye. They can't just disappear, he said. It's not possible. Could they have used a boat? Felix asked. The idea had just struck him. The others looked at him incredulously. Use a boat? Hef said. In the stew? Spider said. Don't be stupid, Rudy said. Felix flushed. I'm not being stupid, look. The tracks end here. It would be quite simple for someone to step down from the ledge into a small skiff. That's the daftest thing I've ever heard, Rudy said. You've got some imagination, young Felix. Who'd ever have thought of using a boat down here? There's a lot of things you'd never think of, Felix snapped. But then thinking's not your strong suit, is it? He looked at the other sewer jacks and shook his head. You're right. A boat doesn't make much sense. Much better to believe they vanished by magic. Maybe a cloud of pixies wafted in and carried them away. That's right. Cloud of pixies. That's more like it, Rudy said. Who's being sarcastic, Rudy? Spider said. A very sarcastic fellow, young Felix, added Hef. Probably right, though. Gottrick said. A boat wouldn't be too hard to come by. The sewers flow into the right, don't they? Easy to steal a small boat. But the outflows into the rivers all have bars, Rudy said, to stop vagrants getting in. And that's our job. If not hunting down those same vagrants when they file through the bars, Felix asked. He could see the idea was starting to filter into even Rudy's thick skull. But why, Manling? Why use boats? Felix felt briefly elated. It wasn't often that Gotrek admitted that Felix might know more than him. He considered the matter rapidly. Well, for a start, they don't leave tracks and they might be connected with a smuggling operation. Suppose someone was bringing Warpstone in by river, 
for instance. Our noble skulker yesterday seemed to be paying the rat man off of it. Boats make me sick. The only thing I hate more than boats is elves, Gotrick said as they set off again. They searched for the rest of the day and found no trace of any skaven, although they did find that the bars had been sawn away on one of the outflows to the Reich. Felix stepped out the street and into the Golden Hammer. He stepped from reality into a dream. The doorman held the great oak door for him. Servile waiters ushered him away from the squalor of the streets into a vast dining hall. Richly clad people sat at well-filled tables and dined and talked by the light that sparkled from huge crystal chandeliers. Portraits of great imperial heroes watched the diners sternly from the walls. Felix recognized Sigma and Magnus and Frederick the Bold. The style of the brushwork was Vespasian's, the most famous Nolner painter of the past three centuries. The far wall was dominated by a portrait of the Elector Emmanuel, a ravishing raven-haired beauty garbed in a less than modest ball gown. Felix wished his borrowed clothing fitted him better. He was wearing some of his brother's old garments. Once, he and Otto had been of the same size and build, but in the years of his wandering, Felix had grown thinner and Otto more stout. The linen shirt felt baggy and the velvet vest felt loose. The trousers had been cinched with a leather belt tightened to its last notch. The boots were a comfortable fit though, as was the cap. He had it tilted to a rakish angle to show off the peacock feather in the band. He let his hand toy idly with the golden pomander that dangled from a chain around his neck. The smell of fine Bretonian perfume wafted up from it. It was nice to smell something other than the sewers. The servant led him to a booth in a corner in which Otto sat. He had a leather-bound accounts book in front of him and was ticking entries off in it with a quill pen. As Felix approached, he looked up and smiled. Welcome, little brother. You're looking much better for a bath and change of clothes. Having studied himself in the great silvered mirror in Otto's townhouse earlier, Felix was forced to agree. A warm bath, scented oil and a change of clothing had made him feel like a new man. In the looking glass he had seen the foppish young dandy he had once been, albeit with more lines around the eyes and a firmer, narrower set to the mouth. This is a very charming establishment, he said. You could dine here every evening if you wished. What do you mean, brother? Simply that this is a place for you, in the family business. Felix looked around to see if they were being overheard. You know, I'm still a wanted man in Altdorf because of the window tax business. You exaggerate your notoriety, little brother. No one knows who the leaders of that riot were. Altdorf isn't known, you know. You said yourself Gotrek is a very easily recognisable figure. We're not offering the Troll Slayer employment. We're offering you your birthright. And there it was. What Felix had half hoped for and half feared. His family would take him back. He would give up the restless, uncomfortable life of the adventurer and return once more to Altdorf and his books. It would mean a life chained to the ledgers and the warehouses, but it would be safe, and one day he would be rich. It was a tempting prospect. No more crawling around in sewers. No more beatings at the hands of thugs. No more catching strange illnesses in terrible 
out-of-the-way places. No more muscle-searing trek through wild, savage lands. No more descents into darkness. No more confrontations with the chaos-worshipping minions of obscure cults. No more adventures. He wouldn't have to put up with Gotrek's sullenness or his whims anymore. He could forget his oath to follow the Troll Slayer and record his doom in an epic poem. The promise had been made when he was drunk. Surely it didn't count. He would be his own master. And yet, something, something held him back. I'll, uh, I'll have to think about it, Felix said. And what is there to think about, man? You can't actually tell me that you prefer being a sewer jack to being a merchant, can you? Most people would kill to be given this opportunity. I said, I'll think about it. They ate on in uncomfortable silence. After some minutes, the door to the great room opened and a tall man was led in by the servant. He was clad in black and his monkish robes made him seem out of place in his opulent setting. His face was thin and ascetic and his black hair ended above his forehead in a widow's peak. As he crossed the room, silence spread in his wake. Felix saw that the wealthy diners were afraid of him. As he passed close to the table, Felix was shocked to recognise him. It was unquestionably the man he had seen in the sewers with the Skaven. His mind reeled. He had assumed that the man was some kind of sorcerer or renegade. He pictured a cultist or a desperado. He had not expected to see him here in the haunts of Nuln's wealthiest and most respectable citizens. What's the matter, brother? You look like you've seen a ghost. <laughs> Who is that man? Otto let out a long sigh. Oh, you don't know. He's not a man that you ask questions about. He asked them about you. Who is he, Otto? Do I have to go over and ask him? Felix saw a look of alarm and admiration pass across his brother's face. I do believe you would too, Felix, he whispered. Very well. That is Chief Magistrate Fritz von Halstadt, the head of Countess Emanuel's secret police. Tell me about him. There are those who see him as the enemy of corruption everywhere. He is hard-working and no one doubts his sincerity. He sincerely hates mutants and for that reason he has the backing of the Temple of Ulrich. His home is guarded by their Templars. I thought the Temple of Ulrich had no power here, that the Countess disliked it. That was before von Halstedt's rise to power. He came from being a minor court functionary to the most powerful man in the city-state very quickly. Some say it was by blackmail. Some say his enemies have a habit of being found dead under mysterious circumstances. He has risen far from a man whose father was a minor nobleman in an out-of-the-way province. A callous, cunning old swine, by all accounts. Von Halstadt is cold, cruel and dangerous, not just because of his influence. He was a deadly blade. He's killed several people because they've insulted the honour of the Countess. I would have thought her brother, Leos, did enough of that without having him to it. Leos is not always about, and rumour has it that our Chief Magistrate would be prepared to fight him over the Countess. Apparently, 
He's got it hard for her. Then he's mad. Leos is the deadliest blade in the Empire, and Emmanuel's not worth fighting over. Otto shrugged. Felix stared at von Helstadt, wondering what the connection between the Skaven and the head of the Countess's secret police could be, and hoping against hope that the man did not recognize him. Von Halstatt was tired. Not even his usual excellent supper could cheer him. His mind was filled with worry and the cares of high office. He looked around at his fellow diners and returned their smiles, but in his heart of hearts he despised them. Shallow, indolent cattle. Garbed like nobles, but with the hearts of shopkeepers. He knew that they needed him. They needed him to keep chaos at bay. They needed him to do the work they were too soft to do themselves. They were barely worth his contempt. It had been a trying day. Young Helmut Slazinger had failed to confess, despite von Halstadt himself supervising the torture implements. It was strange how some of them maintained their innocence even into the grave. Even when they knew that he knew they were guilty. His secret sources had told him that Slazinger belonged to a clandestine cell of Slanesh worshipping cultists. The jailers had been unable to find any of the usual tattoos that marked Coven members, but that meant nothing. His most trusted informants, the Skaven, had let him in on the secret. That, in fear of his ruthless crusade, his hidden enemies had taken to using sorcerous tattoos, visible only to fellow Coven members. Gods, how insidious the mutant fiends were. Now they could be everywhere, they could be sitting right in this very room. Their initiation tattoos plain to each other on their faces, and he would not know. They could be sitting there right now, mocking him, and there was nothing he could do about it. That lanky young fellow in the ill-fitting clothes could be one. He was certainly studying von Halstatt intently enough. And come to think of it, there was something quite sinister about him. Perhaps he should be the next subject of an official investigation. No, get a grip on yourself, von Halstatt told himself. They cannot hide forever. The blinding light of logic can pierce the deepest darkness of falsity. So his father had always told him before yet another beating for his sins real or imagined. No, his father had been correct. Von Halstatt had done wrong, even if he could not work out exactly what. The beatings had been for his own good, to drive out sin. His father had been a good man, doing the work of the righteous. That was why he smiled as he punished him. He didn't enjoy it, he told him that over and over. It was for his own good. In a way, it had been a great lesson. He had learned that it was often necessary to do painful, bad things for the greater good. It had made him hard. It enabled him to do what he had to do today, free from the weakness of lesser men. It enabled him to stand up for right. It had made him into a man his father could be proud of, and he should be grateful. He was strong without being malicious. He was like his father. He had taken no pleasure in the torture of Long Slazinger. He had taken no pleasure in the Skaven report that the nobleman was a Slaneshi cultist. Although... He had to admit that it was a fortunate coincidence. 
given the rumours concerning Slazenger and Emmanuel. More malicious lies. Someone as pure as the Countess would not, could not, have anything to do with the likes of Slazenger. The worm was a notorious rake, the sort of handsome young dandy who thought it witty to speak out against the lawful servants of the state, to criticise the harsh measures needed to maintain law and order in this festering sink of iniquity and sin. He pushed Slazenger from his mind and gave his thoughts over to other concerns. His agent in the watch house had brought him the report on the Gant incident. No action was being taken. It would cost too much to make a full sweep through the sewers beneath the old quarter, and that would cut into the take the watch captain got from his station's financial allocation. Well, even corruption sometimes has its uses, thought von Halstatt. His spy had brought him word that Gant's patrol had been nosing around in the area of his death, which was worrying. They might accidentally come across some more Skaven going about their business. They might even discover the skiffs that ran from the docks to Van Nyck's Emporium. He doubted, though, that they could ever discover that the shop was simply a government front which channeled Warpstone from outside the city to the Skaven in payment for their services. He smiled. It was an arrangement with a certain pleasing symmetry. He paid the Skaven in the currency they wanted. They did not seem to realise it was both useless and dangerous. Warpstone actually caused mutation. The Skaven claimed to use it as food. Well, it was a relatively harmless way of disposing of an incredibly dangerous substance, and it provided him with a fine source of information at the same time. Yes, a pleasing symmetry indeed. In a way, it was a pity that he could not make known the service he was doing the Empire by disposing of the evil stuff in a safe way. It had been a lucky day for all mankind when von Halstott had got lost in the sewers and stumbled across the Skaven. It was fortunate they had recognised him as a man with whom they could do business. He must get some more. This very evening he must contact another Skaven agent and see to it that the watchman met with an accident. He was sorry to have to do that to men who were only doing their duty, but his security must come first. He was the only man who understood the real dangers threatening Nolm, and he was the only man who could save the city. He knew this wasn't simply vanity, it was the truth. Tonight, he would contact the new Skaven leader, Grey Seer Thankwell and order him to eliminate his enemies. The thought of this secret use of his power made him shiver. He told himself it was not with pleasure. I'm telling you, I saw him last night, Felix insisted. The other sewer jacks stared at him out of the gloom. Overhead, he heard the thunder of wheels as a car passed over a manhole cover. At the Golden Hammer, he was standing not twenty feet away from me. His name is Fritz von Halstadt, and he's the man we saw dealing with the Skaven. Sure, Rudy said, glancing back worriedly. As he was having dinner with the Countess Emmanuel and the Enchanter Drachenfels, what were you doing in the Golden Hammer, anyway? It's where knobs go. They wouldn't let a sewer jack in there if his clothes are made of spun gold. You don't expect us to believe you were there. My brother took me. He's a merchant. And I'm telling you, that's where I saw our man. Von Halstadt. You're not from Nolan, are you, young Felix? Hef spoke calmly and helpfully 
as if he were genuinely concerned with clearing up any misapprehension the young sewer jack might have. Do you know who Fritz von Halster is? The head of the known secret police is who he is. The scourge of mutant scum in the city, Spider said. A tick moved somewhere far back in the twins' jaw. Felix had not realised the twins were such great admirers of von Halstatt's. And the head of the secret police don't go about concerting with rat men. Why not? Because he's the head of the secret police, and the head of the secret police wouldn't do that sort of thing. Stands to reason, don't it? Well, that is irrefutable logic, Rudy. But I'm telling you, I saw him with my own eyes. It was the man from the sewers. Are you sure you're not mistaken, Manling? It was very dark down there, and human eyesight is not good in the dark. I'm certain, said Felix. I've never been more certain of anything in my life. Well, young Felix, even if you're right, and I'm not saying that you are, mind, what could we do about it? We can hardly go marching up to the Countess Emmanuel and say, by the way, your majesty, did you know your most trusted advisor has been sneaking around the sewers below your palace in the company of giant talking rats? Heff didn't even smile as he said this. She'd ask you how much weird root you've been chewing and order her Kislevite lover to throw you in the cells, Spider said. Felix could see their point. What could they do? They were just ordinary watchmen and the man he was talking about was the most powerful person in the city. Perhaps it would be best just to forget the whole thing. He was seeing Otto again this evening. He was going to have a fine meal in his townhouse. Soon he could be far from here and it wouldn't be his problem. But the thought nagged at him. What was the terrible and feared master of the Countess's secret police doing in the company of Skaven. What hold could they possibly have over him? Right lads, enough of this, Rudy said. Back to work. <laughs>